you know, this this kind of uh, pullback or oil bust, depending on the term you use, um, you know, the last time something like this happened in the U.S. would have been 08, 09. Look, the, our business, the oil and gas business, moves in cycles. So, you know, every five years, every eight years, every ten years, something like this, somewhere in there, you're going to have a correction, you're going to have a pullback. But, you know, I, I look at this as very similar to, you know, when you're uh, a teenager or you're a middle school kid, you ride a roller coaster. You know, it goes up, it goes up, it goes up, and then it goes down for a brief period of time. Uh, what we've really experienced in the, you know, energy renaissance the U.S. has experienced since 05 has really been a lot more of the fun part of going down rather than the, you know, uh, more painful and slow part of going up and up and up. Um, but, you know, now is a time of correction and now is a time of, uh, you know, when one needs to have some patience and the industry uh, is going to shake itself out and there's going to be winners and losers, definitely more losers than winners. Uh, but, you know, something like $150 billion of projects in the U.S. have been pushed in the past 90 days, pushed or canceled U.S. energy projects. But I, you know, I see opportunity in that. I think in in those cancellations lies the the seeds of opportunity, the seeds of you know the next up cycle in the in the medium term. How does that how does that play out? Again, again, when you started mentioning the dates, Dan, we're talking with Dan Eberhardt from Canary LLC. And Dan, when you first mentioned the dates of the last pullback was in 2008. That's really before the Marcellus play began here in northeastern Pennsylvania. So yeah, as I, I said, we're 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 sort of brand new to this whole up down thing. All of a sudden, there was this great hiring uh, binge, and people talked about how this is uh, you know a, a, a 50 year supply of natural gas under the ground by the time we dug it all up. And uh, then within a couple of years, all of a sudden it seemed like as if there was a pullback. Now I assume that the Saudis are playing some either direct or indirect role in that. But uh, again, as you point out, this is this comes with the calendar almost. It, it's the kind of thing that that can be uh, predicted and uh, and survived. Yeah. So this this is you know just just something that happens. I will say you know for the Marcells, which is a mostly natural gas play, uh, you know there was somewhat of a correction in 2009, 2010 on the natural gas side of the business. Obviously, uh, for oil for the oil side of the business, it's the first correction since the kind of 08, 09 downturn. Um, but look, the the industry moves in these kind of cycles. The Marcellus is a world class gas play. You know, uh, company Stat Oil, a very large Norwegian company, considers the Marcellus one of its three uh, 50 year play long term strategic core interests. The Marcellus is some, uh, responsible for something like 37 percent of the shale gas uh, produced in the U S. this year. The Marcellus is a world class basin with world-class potential and it's I mean it's realizing that potential now and the potential is going to grow I also think in the medium term as the US looks to export LNG with Sabine Pass and uh, projects like that coming online on the Gulf Coast I think that we are going to be looking at a larger you know role for natural gas for US natural gas worldwide explain that Dan maybe you can help explain that to some of the rest of us rookies out here um, a, a lot of people are, are looking at this and they're saying, well, gee, if the, the L, you know, if LNG, if liquefied natural gas goes overseas, then that means it won't be here. Or if it goes overseas, then that means that the price of it's going to go up. And that's bad for us. Uh, not necessarily so. Perhaps you can explain that. Yeah, well, I, I think if we, uh, and, and the oil and gas export uh, ban on the oil side is also something that's very near and dear to my heart. But in terms of LNG, yeah, we're, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that in a minute. But uh, uh, okay, that, 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 that's one of the things that really gets my motor revving. But in, in terms of LNG, look, I think that, that you know the oil price is more of a worldwide price. Natural gas has historically been more continent based and hemisphere based. So you have in places like Korea and Japan, they're paying 12, 14, 16, 18 bucks an NCF, whereas in places like Pennsylvania and Northeast. Uh, producers are being paid, uh, you know, right now in the range of three, four, five dollars in MCF, and so there's really a vast disparity. I think you actually get the opposite. You know, it may cause some uh, uh, pressure on the upward mount of where the where the price of natural gas is locally, but what you're going to do is you you're going to expand the market and create a lot more local jobs in Western Pennsylvania, a lot more um, economic activity in Western Pennsylvania because the market size is going to be that much bigger. Instead of the market being fo focused on the eastern U.S., the northeastern U.S., 
the market for the Marcellus field suddenly becomes worldwide if we can export out of the Gulf Coast and these other LNG um, export facilities. The market becomes Asia. The market becomes Western Europe. And, you know, you could see a doubling, tripling, or quadrupling of the demand for Marcellus gas. That's going right. to more jobs locally. Right. I was just going to say that that, that really here, and especially here in northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, that uh, I would, I'm guessing that that provides long-term support to the price and therefore long-term support to the, shall we say, the incentive for uh, getting the gas out in the first place. Yeah, and, and it also it makes it makes it easier for the owners of the midstream assets, so the the pipeline, the gas processing facilities, the separation facilities, and the refineries, to make those long-term capital investments that need two hundred million dollar, five hundred million dollar, you know, billion dollar plus projects to push the green the green button on those projects, if they think the market is worldwide as opposed to just you know eastern. Um, the East Coast or just, you know, Pennsylvania, you know, the 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 Marcellus is um, a very, very large gas field, and we can get, you know, we can turn that into a world, so make that base in a world supplier of gas, and I think that's great for the economic impact for Pennsylvania. Yeah, obviously so. All right, now let's get to this uh, oil export ban. Uh, I know that this is something that is, uh, as you said, really kind of winds you up. Um, and, and this, I assume, goes to the notion that we have had in place, I guess, what, since the first Arab oil embargo, uh, we've had in place this uh, this rule against, uh, statute against exporting crude from this country. Uh, it has to be some sort of process. Explain that. Yeah, so so it was basically, um, it came from the Energy Policy and Conser uh, Conservation Act. It was passed, I believe, in December 1975 in response to the oil Arab embargo, in response to, um, you know, people panicking, uh, the lines at the gas stations, the odd even number can buy fuel, uh, what license tag uh, place can buy fuel, and those kind of things. Well, it was really passed in a different era. We were in an era where, U.S. oil production was in decline. We were importing it from the Middle East. The Middle East was getting leverage over us, and people were very, very nervous. Look, the situation has completely changed. Um, the the shale revolution has added three and a half to four million barrels a day of oil onto the world market. The U.S. production has been increasing rapidly. If the U.S. the net increase in production in the U.S. in the past five years just the net increase would make us a medium-sized uh, oil-producing country in OPEC. I think that's just a phenomenal statistic, but it's really changed the whole changed the whole situation. And so the the oil export ban, uh, I think, is an outdated, anachronistic law um, that does not help us, you know, develop our economy, develop our natural resources you know, grow the number of jobs we have in the oil and gas business in the U.S. And, and I just think that it's time has come to be repealed. Right. Now, this no longer uh, serves uh, the reality on the ground here, I'm guessing. That's, I mean, that, that is, which is obviously quite different from what things were in the mid-70s. Yeah, I, I, yeah. the the situation has completely changed. And I think, you know, there's, there's a Senate hearing tomorrow in D.C. I'm going to be at uh, that's on repealing the export ban. It's, it definitely has some traction in Congress. You know, there's kind of different schools of thought about the, um, you know, politically handi uh, the handicap of whether or not we can get the repeal through this Congress. But it's definitely something that's ripe. It's definitely something that's on the table and being considered. And I and I really feel like if if one spends 15 minutes or 30 minutes and reads four or five articles and and understands the issue, I, I think it just makes sense. We can export natural gas. We can export coal. We can export chairs. We can export vehicles. Why why not be able to export oil and gas? You know, when you when you increase the, the simple economics, when you increase the supply of something, what happens? Sure, the demand uh, goes down, and, this, and therefore the price generally tends to fall. The price the price falls. Right. You know, this is this whole situation is also creating a a supply glut in the U.S. oil storage capacity. Um, you know, proverbially centered in Cushing, Oklahoma. And we wouldn't have these issues if we could export oil freely on the open market. My prediction is that uh, the U.S. production is going to continue to rise through April, May, June, 
and somewhere around June will begin to decline. I think uh, it's already, we've already seen the decline number in North Dakota. Uh, but I think when that happens, you know, if demand is constant, I see the, the oil price rising 90 to 120 days after that. So I think we're looking at somewhere around uh, Q1 2015, we start to see a, uh, uh, a decent, uh, you know, rise in the price of oil. The, the other thing that I uh, would like to mention. Isn't that about the same I, time the Saudis are predicting that, uh, that our whole domestic uh, production is going to fall apart? Uh, yes, yes, it is actually. So <laughs> that's very interesting, um, Kevin. And, and then I'll also segue to, uh, if I can make uh, one more point sure. for my last point. What, what I think is going on right now is I think we've got a battle royale going on between U.S. shale producers and between uh, OPEC nominally, but really uh, Saudi Arabia. And what I think is happening right now is I think the crown of swing producer, the person that the the entity that has the uh, power to move the oil price, I think the pendulum has really swung back from OPEC to the U.S., the U.S. shale producers. And, you know, uh, the WTI and the, and the U.S. really had the authority and was the main producer in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and then over time in the middle of the 20th century, the, the pendulum swung uh, to be in OPEC's favor. But I think that at this point, OPEC is really a paper tiger. The U.S. and uh, the free economy that the U.S. is has reacted swiftly, has reacted um, fiercely to the drop in the price of oil, and I think that makes the U.S. the new swing producer. So in, in the end, I think while painful for some in the industry in the short term, I think it shows the success of the free market economy in the U.S., and I think it shows the power swindle really, pendulum really switching back to the U.S. after a 50 to 75-year, you know, hiatus of residing in Vienna with with OPEC. Uh, 